Nick Brown to come and uh, take over and guide us to the next panel on uh, green sweeping. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, congratulations once again to Nicholas and the Capital Link team for putting together a wonderful conference. And um, today we have the very short topic of net zero. <laughs> Alternative fuels and technology, and I'm delighted um, to be joined by such a wonderful panel today on a panel across John, Konstantinos, uh, Stelios, Bud, and Dor. We've got every sector of shipping represented, from energy shipping, cruise, liner, uh, dry and wet shipping. And of course, we've got digital solution providers and AI, and we've got energy saving devices and um, uh, carbon reduction technology represented. So a, a big part of the ingredients uh, that we need to make, make good progress. Last year with MEPC 80, we saw the landmark decisions clarifying that we weren't heading towards a 50% reduction. Our target is net zero by or close to 2050. And we all know now what the main challenges are and the main ways that we will get there. We need huge investments in the production of new fuels. We need continued investment and advancement in technologies. We need thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to be trained. We need policy and regulation, and not least, we need market-based measures to make this possible and sustainable for the industry. By 2030, which let's remind ourselves, six years away, we have to reach a 40% reduction in our carbon intensity versus 2008, and we are aiming to move towards at least 5%, striving for 10% of, of zero or close to zero uh, fuels or technologies. So an immense amount to do. And I'm probably going to open the floor first to the shipping companies on the panel, and perhaps start with Bud, Stelios, and, and John just to perhaps introduce what your companies are doing to start down this road uh, and uh, the risks and opportunities that you see. Bud, do you want to start? Yeah, um, good morning everyone and, and thanks Nick. That should take only about five days, but um, I think we'll do our best to be concise. Uh, congratulations, uh, Nicholas, another great event, great turnout, and I, I have to say, um, the nature of the discussion among ship owners, whether I'm in Athens or whether I'm in Dubai or whether I'm in London, has changed dramatically. And it's gone from, do we really have to do any of this, to what is it we're going to have to do, to how can we get it done? And now the focus is really on how can we get it done. Our company has you know, more exposure than you know, most, for sure, uh, and across many different ship types, and a lot of people don't realize we're the number three cruise line operator in the world as well by, by size, uh, and a large ocean ferry operator. So most of the challenges, we, we have some bulk carriers as well, um, most of the challenges the whole industry is facing, we're facing. And a couple of key points, uh, one is, you know, this won't happen unless we're open-minded and creative, uh, and optimistic. I think you have to keep all three of those in play. Don't think we have all the answers or to the solution set on the table today, because I don't believe we do. I think there will be some more that emerge. Um, second, I think that it's really important that we keep the world open to a multi-fuel solution set. It would be much easier for my company, most of the companies here, if somebody would just tell us, here's the fuel you have to use. Go out and buy the ships and buy the fuel. Well, we don't have the fuels, and on some of the types of fuels that it would take, the technology readiness is not there to buy the ships. So um, it, it's not that simple, and it's not going to be that simple. One size does not fit all. We know that from our fleet, so I think if you look more broadly at the maritime community and the 60,000 ships that are trading out there, one size isn't going to fit all for them either. So the other thing is we won't have enough. We won't have enough molecules to meet... I don't even think the 2030 um, 
level of ambition or indicative checkpoint, as IMO has, has said recently, um, without multiple fuels, 2040, probably not. 2050, definitely not. I mean, we need multiple fuel tracks, and we also need not just the molecules, but I think we can't talk just in terms of synthetics, but we also have to keep the bio track open too. And one reason I say that is it's not very efficient to take this massive amount of renewable energy we will need, almost doubling what's on the planet today just to serve the needs of shipping, to put it into production of these e-fuels that we're all counting on in the end, and that might be e-methanol, e-methane, which will become LNG, and then um, uh, green ammonia as well, and maybe, maybe you use the green hydrogen in some applications. That's not a very efficient process. It's what we need, and we're definitely hoping for that, and we're investing in that as a sector, and the energy sector is as well. But what happens if governments wake up one day and say, wait a second, we need that on the grid, and we don't have access to that renewable energy. We're going to wish we had that biological track still available for particularly methanol, methane, and, and biodiesels. Uh, I'll leave it at that uh, out of respect for the other, other members of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Bud Celius. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, Nick, thank you so much for the invitation. Like, we don't take it for granted, so it's really a uh, appreciate it. Sorry, I, I, don't, I don't need to speak to, uh, to the microphone. I always like when I sit next to Bud and, you know, we talk about the numbers. Like the, the world energy system is 100 million barrels a day. Add gas, about 70 million barrels a day, oil equivalent. Marine, we're using about 2, 3 percent of that. So that's a small number. Now, the esteemed organization that, you know, Nick leads, uh, you know, they came up with a very interesting uh, calculus, which is in 2030, if you were to meet the target, you would need 20% of the green hydrogen available. That's a tall order. So, um, with that said, we're fuel agnostic, um, and what we're looking for in a fuel is that it fits our near and long-term decarbonization objectives with flexibility to respond to future developments. We need to think and act based on what is available and safe to operate today. And that for us is LNG. So LNG, with tightly controlled methane slip, delivers greenhouse gas savings today and has the potential to get to net zero through the use of biomethane and synthetic LNG, like Bud said earlier. Differently from MSC, you know, we are mostly in the Trumpic business. Um, which means that you know, we can only invest in vessels uh, that are, that, you know, um, which, which means that we can only invest in vessels using alternative fuels once there is enough supply uh, and, there, and, there, and there is a availability of the supply infrastructure around the globe. With LNG, we're getting to that point now. It's taken us many, many years to get there. Uh, you know, you had a, a huge system on a, you know, bulk, but you know, to make it retail is very challenging. I know that because my previous job was you know, doing it from the fuel side. <laughs> we applaud initiatives like Green Corridors. Uh, they're great um, because it helps kick start alternative fuels on specific routes. But we have to accept that the trumping business is not able to participate in that unless, you know, or, or, until, uh, or until you know, it's widely you know, more available. So I think what is interesting given Bud's comments is that we operate in the whole spectrum, like, you know, they have, you know, you guys have cruises and uh, containers, if I get it right. <laughs> you know, we are, in, you know, in the bulkers and the, and the tanker and the LNG carrier sector. Uh, very different business models as well, in the sense that, you know, we are, you know, in a value chain with a charter party, whereas, you know, sometimes, you know, you own the cargo and the operation. So, but it's quite interesting that, you know, we're coming to some similar type of conclusions, which is, uh, for now and for the future, LNG is a very nice platform. Uh, so that's an interesting point to me. <laughs> um, so um, I'm optimistic that the conversation about sleep, which methane sleep with regards to, to LNG is a very you know, challenging point, uh, we will have that conversation over the next years. It will be different you know, in five, ten years, I hope. What we are doing um, is we're not sitting still um, and we're not waiting for the technology to develop. Uh, at Angelicus Group, you know, we're an active member of the uh, Methane Abatement Marine Innovation Initiative um, and we're installing, we're actually going to 
putting money you know, where our mouth is. So we're installing a Sleep Pure uh, system on board one of our LNG carriers, which is chartered to one of our charter parties. And this was publicly announced uh, last year in Gastec 2023. For you know, our other dual fuel vessels, you know, we're using very efficient, uh, little or no slip engines. So you know, there is there's, there's things that you can do. Um, so with regards to, because there is significant progress in methane slip, regulations should not undercut the LNGs, synthetic and biomethane, or even fossil LNG potential by mandating the use of default greenhouse gas footprint. So these are the, the greenhouse gas you know, default values that are based on older uh, technologies. So regulation that, like that, we don't feel it's very helpful as it limits decarbonization options when you need it most, knowing that you will need to meet the challenging target. Again, we're not saying don't use default values, but what we're simply saying is don't want to be locked with these values as it takes away the incentive to improve versus these defaults. So this has to be a recognition for it. Finally, to stimulate the development of biomethane and synthetic LNG, I think it's important that you know, uh, you know, we keep options open and you know, a book and claim system should be allowed to get the low carbon methane molecules from production sites to ports using the existing natural gas pipeline infrastructure. So allow allowing this will stimulate production and avoid unnecessary dedicated transport of low carbon materials. That's my last two points. Sorry, sorry I've taken so long, but I think it's important. So it's important for regulators to look forward um, you know, when you know, they're formulating policy on low carbon fuels, which LNG is one of them. And the industry you know, will need to have a basket of fuels for the future, like Pat said earlier. So limiting options today will only negatively impact um, you know, our efforts to get to net zero. Thank you, Stelios, and I totally agree with uh, the point around making sure we have the right incentives uh, to make sure that whatever molecule we're using today in shipping, we don't automatically assume that that molecule produces exactly the same amount of emissions regardless of how it's used on board. We have to make sure that our technology today and the technology providers have the right incentives to address these challenges like methane slip, but also look at the possibilities of fuel cells and other things that can perhaps convert today's molecules uh, more effectively. Moving to John, uh, more specialized cargo, John, more specialized trades. Can you t give us a bit of an update on Dorian's plan? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Kalimara says, good morning to everybody. Thank you for being here, Nicola. Um, and uh, what a great start from uh, Bud and Stelios to cover um, two different, different kind of viewpoints on uh, how we can go forward. Uh, Dorian is in the LPG business. Um, we carry gases. Um, LNG is very close to what we carry, uh, just different temperatures, um, different characteristics. But uh, the gas business is uh, what we kind of know very well. And we believe that um, these gases like LNG and LPG are transition fuels to, um, from the carbon age, let's say, uh, carbon fuels, carbon age, to the hydrogen age. I think that's where we're going. And uh, I think that's where ammonia comes in in the future of, of, of the business, um, which is one of the ways that our ships uh, are easy to carry ammonia, uh, easily uh, upgradable, or uh, we don't need to build that many ships because the big uh, LPG fleet can be upgraded to carry ammonia. Uh, it is um, something that produces uh, no carbon, uh, produces, of course, a lot of nitrogen oxides, which are very dangerous, probably 300 times worse uh, for, for the greenhouse gas uh, considerations. But I think we have developed a way to neutralize those gases. Uh, there is, of course, the nitrogen slip or uh, some kind of nitrogen uh, 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 from an ammonia engine. And there is also the pilot fuel that we have to worry about. So there's a number of issues to go forward. But uh, I believe that with LPG, with LNG, um, and methanols, uh, we transition towards the 2030s when we're going to start seeing 
the uh, better fuels with uh, less carbon emissions. And that's where we're going. We think that um, having done everything on our vessels to improve their performance by probably 20%, uh, and we're proud for that, uh, we think that uh, we need to do a lot more. And uh, the way to do it is um, probably for our ships, it would be some kind of carbon capture for the time being until we find a new uh, fuel technology that will take us in the next decade or to 2050. So that's where we see things standing right now. Thank you, John. And that gives me perhaps a nice segue to Konstantinos. Um, as a provider of technologies to try and make shipping as we know it today, cleaner, greener, more reliable. Perhaps you can tell us what you're hearing from your customers in terms of expectations and demands and how you think Irma First can support us on this net zero journey. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everyone. Before addressing this topic, uh, Olga and Nikos, thank you so much for organizing for 14th time this event. I'm delighted and uh, honored to be here. Um, every um, day that, uh, the, the, the day before the Capital Link um, um, conference, I'm writing too many notes and I never use them. So this, uh, this time, yesterday, I told myself that I need to stick in my notes. Anyway, I will try. Um, yeah, um, definitely we are in an in, in, in a, in a, in a era where the technology should play a significant role targeting the 2030 uh, goals. Uh, as a representative of that technology, uh, I need to provide with uh, evidences that this uh, will be done. So allow me to reiterate a statement I made about a year ago in the same, at the same conference uh, in 2023. So back then, I said that presently, we operate a relatively young and efficient fleet predominantly fueled by heavy fuel, oil, and its derivatives. Achieving the 2030 objectives with a modern fleet reliant on fossil fuels necessitates minor adjustments focusing mainly on operational changes and the installation of readily available energy-saving devices such as propeller caps, propeller ducts, air lubrication, when, uh, wind assistant, propulsion system, etc. Drawing parallels with past trends in ballast water treatment and exhaust gas cleaning systems, where we transitioned from the promise phase to the efficiency uh, phase, I dare to say that with energy saving technologies, we are currently at the truth stage. This signifies that we're presently witnessing tangible gains start ranging from 2 to 10 percent uh, using uh, these uh, technologies. For instance, installing a propeller cap with a modest capex of 50 to 60k, we monitor gains in the range of 2 to 3 percent, which made such an investment a very promising and appealing investment. Same um, efficiency gains we can see, or even more, or even higher, we can see with the rest of uh, energy saving devices available into the market. Looking ahead to the period between 2030 and 2035, 2040, carbon capture and storage emerges as an appealing solution. However, its installation and operation on boards um, needs some maturity, especially on the capture uh, of the CO2 capture handling and the logistics uh, related on this. Nonetheless, initial installation for carbon capture and storage plants have already commenced and several more are pending for this year and uh, 2025. So in conclusion, at Therma First, we strongly advocate for the pivotal role of the technology in meeting the targets of 2030 onwards. Thank you. Thank you, Konstantinos. And maybe I'm just going to stay with you for a minute on carbon capture and storage, because, um, of course, the 
technology on board the ship is just part of the iceberg. Big part of that iceberg is then what happens or what's required to happen in terms of landside infrastructure. Give us a bit of an idea of what your hopes and dreams are for what we, what we can expect in terms of investment on the land side so that there's somewhere for this carbon to be landed. Okay, that's uh, the wishful thinking, okay. Uh, definitely, you know, I wish and I think that every ship owner or ship manager wishes the same uh, with me, that every single port will have a carbon capture, a carbon um, uh, reception facility, and this reception facility will charge no money or little amount of money, and this carbon will be firstly utilized in industries like the farming industry, We've seen this already happening in the Netherlands or other countries where they have uh, too many uh, greenhouses. Uh, we hope to see it uh, utilized in the food industry and beverage. We hope to see it uh, being used in the cement industry. And the last uh, way of treating hydro uh, um, um, CO2 is the sequestration. So this is my wishful thinking. However, the, the reality is a bit different. We've seen that billions of uh, euros uh, have been invest, uh, are in investing states at the moment in, uh, in different uh, port re uh, reception facilities or sequestration plants around uh, Europe. And um, an, equal, an equal amount of money uh, we have seen being invested uh, worldwide. And we see that year after year, the number of uh, sequestration plants or CO2 utilization plant is growth exponentially. Um, last year's uh, report from the, the International Carbon Capture Association uh, was naming about 80 plants ready, available in 2023, in 2022, while the same report uh, names about um, 300 plants for 2023 and about 500 plants for 2024. So we've seen a progress there, and we hope that this progress somehow would be linked with the ports. Very encouraging. I'm going to move over then to Dor. Um, clearly, we've seen quite a, 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 also a bit of a land shift in the connectivity of deep sea shipping with low orbit satellites. Uh, AI and digitalization technologies are now, I think, accelerating in terms of their um, opportunities and acceptance across the sector. Dor, how much, how much of the net zero um, jigsaw puzzle can you provide, do you think? Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful event. We must bring in digital tools and abilities for our seafarers to be minded on the effects of their own navigation and operations and the impact of that onto emissions reduction. Now today in Naval Academies, this is not part of the syllabus. Uh, learning to navigate a ship is mainly about safety of navigation, but there are very interesting synergies between safety, performance, and efficiency. So for example, we need to find true economical incentives for our young crews to really understand the impact and implications of their decisions on board. So digitalization of capabilities such as uh, lookout, such as ordinary tasks on board that might have dramatic impact on emissions should be both shared between the office and the crew, should be probably monitored via tangible KPIs with strong economical benefits for these crews to actually adhere and listen to these advanced tools to provide them the capabilities to reduce emissions. And it's basically a combined effort of both the office and the crews um, to meet the sustainability goals. And as I see it, unless we provide the seafarer on board the adequate tools which are not complicated and not adding more tasks to the day-to-day -day job, we can easily find potential savings without even changing the existing infrastructure of connectivity, of digitalization, of uh, real-time capabilities. 
uh, but it is a combined effort of the entire organization, both on the shore side, both from fleet management and superintendents and navigation departments, but also the uh, green ship departments and emission reduction departments. So we, again, I foresee that we'll start seeing a lot of interesting synergies between different departments that have different KPIs uh, to work together alongside with the seafarers to reduce emissions. Thank you. I'm picking up a bit of a trend over the last 25 minutes or so um, where we are really highlighting the importance of what we can do today uh, with today's fuels, with today's technologies and how we can advance those, how we can make sure that we're not waiting for this new infrastructure and for these new molecules to become available. Maybe going to move back to, to Bud and, and, and Stelios, perhaps, just to talk a little bit more about how we're getting this balance right between our fuels today and what effort we're putting in to make today's ships more efficient and have we got the right regulation balanced correct and uh, perhaps more John's point around ammonia and when, th when those technologies and fuels and molecules are actually going to be available. Uh, first of all, I apologize. I think I mismanaged my time initially a little bit. So I'm going to cover a lot of stuff very quickly here. So work with me. <laughs> I didn't mean to speak just in generalities and avoid the specifics. So please don't think that. We are known for being somewhat secretive, but it's mostly because we're a privately held company. And that has some big advantages I'll speak to in a moment. Um, what we are doing today is what we can do today, which is we have a large order book of over 100 LNG dual fueled ships available uh, on, on the books right now, coming into our fleet of about 800 cellular container ships. So um, that's a pretty significant number, but you need to keep it in context of the denominator of 800 ships in our fleet. That's what we can do today. But if we think it's just fossil fuel LNG from here going forward, I'm sure we've made a big mistake, so we don't. Uh, we think that you need to get off of fossil LNG and onto bio and synthetic production LNGs as soon as you can. Um, that is going to be driven by a lot of factors we don't control, but I can assure you we're working on that every day and trying to get the energy providers to get the demand signal they need to provide that, because that is essential for the long-term longevity of these ships. So what else are we doing? We are spending as much capex up front as we can stand to try and de-risk the longer-term investments that we're talking about here, because you're making, you know, at times, you know, a modern cruise ship is probably a 40-year lifespan. We don't know exactly for sure, but somewhere between 30 and 40 years on limited information and also in a dynamic environment. So the best available fuel in 2030 actually for that ship can be very different in 2038 or 2042 or whatever. So you want to build in as much flexibility up front as you can, and we're doing that. So for example, we're thinking about if LNG turns out not to be the most successful outcome for those particular ships to do what we can do today. And there's pretty good data that says, despite the rhetoric you hear to the contrary, that with the right application, you can get about a 20% uh, well-to-wake reduction uh, in greenhouse gas emissions um, using fossil LNG. That number might be less, but it should be positive if you're actually looking at this objectively. And we can do that today. We can make a difference. So what else are we doing? We are uh, preparing for ammonia for the future. We think that has a role. So we're building a subset of our LNG fueled ships with tanks that will be compatible with ammonia. Again, doing the hard stuff up front with extra capex so that we can accommodate that later when it comes. Uh, we have on the cruise side of our business uh, a, a major uh, step forward with regard to using hydrogen directly. It's not the entire energy consumption of the ship, but we've got two luxury ships on order um, that are going to have six megawatt PEM hydrogen fueled uh, fuel cell stacks on them. That's pretty significant. Six megawatts is a lot. We also are working on carbon capture projects. We're working on methanol projects. And while we like to focus on the new builds, because that's easier and it's fun and you can kind of see it, we've got a long tail like the rest of the industry does of retrofitting we've got to keep in mind. And the retrofitting solutions may look very differently. And I think methanol has a serious role to play. And to tie a couple of those things together, even the biggest proponents of green methanol won't say it gets you to 100%. 
it's probably in an optimistic scenario an 80 to 85 percent solution which is probably fine for a number of years but when you get to 2050 what are you going to do with that residual maybe carbon capture has a role in that maybe some other technologies when it comes to carbon capture i sailed on submarines a long time ago when i was taller and more fit um, we captured carbon all the time in the hull you can do that that's the easy part managing the life cycle of the carbon is the hard part and accounting for it along the way is gonna be key to the acceptance of that and letting that be part of the solution and also giving a little bit more longevity to some of the fossil fuel solutions that may be available in the short term now. Uh, I'll stop my comments there, but I could go on all day if you would allow me, thank you. Stelios, I'm sure you've got something to add. I, I was doing a lot of nodding, like, because you know, it just makes a lot of sense. Like. Um, I'm glad that you know Bud covered that. That's that's very important, and you know it's it, it's it's really great company. You know, looking at you know what you guys are doing, it's 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 pretty it's pretty it's pretty great. Um, we already said you know on on my on my previous kind of remarks, we already said about the um, uh, the default values. We already said about methane slip. Uh, we already said about book and claim that will facilitate the uptake of uh, uh, synthetic uh, methane and biomethane. So we're going to need a basket of fuels and the mindset that will optionality will have to be safeguarded. So that brings us to the essential point for the development of IMOs meter measures. And you know, you can I alluded to that, so I'm just gonna kind of spend a couple of minutes for that. Uh, I won't be as long as before. <laughs> so so we need as much certainty as possible um, with respect to the timeline uh, and on the associated enforcement uh, carbon mechanism uh, that will be used. But we need to retain compliance options for ships during this peri period, you know, to make sure that the shipping industry is not becoming hostage to an overheated zero carbon market when you have it there. Because, as you guys said, there's not going to be enough hydrogen. And as we know, you know, it's probably going to be a lot of sectors that we're going to have to compete against. Uh, so essentially, what is needed is that we should avoid situations where regulation is mandating use of specific fuels, and there is no way out of this if prices of such fuels cannot go through the roof. So we need to build these emergency exits within these regulations. That's very important. So to us, like, you know, a well-designed global fuel standard with a gradual increasing level of ambition, a pooling option, and a penalty system similar to fuel EU maritime offers advantages over an industry-financed subsidy system that would not have similar long-term predictability. And I think you need to have that long-term predictability because you know, having these mechanisms, you, know, you will need to show that long-term stability for the fuel supplier and the ship owner to invest in that in the long run. Otherwise, you cannot make it. You need the fuel suppliers to do it as well. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to come back to John. Okay. Um, John, we've, we've seen quite a uh, stampede, I think is probably the right word to use, of interest in uh, a new type of vessel, VLACs. Um, and of course, it makes total sense that if we're going to introduce a new fuel like ammonia, we let the people who are going to be carrying it as a cargo uh, and loading that ammonia at professional dedicated ammonia terminals um, uh, show us the way to do it safely, to do it um, in the best interest of the seafarers. I think today we recognize that across the LPG and, and LNG sector, there's a very enviable safety record. So as we prepare for that future where ammonia might be introduced as a fuel, what is it that we can learn from the LPG and the LNG sector? Thank you, Nick. Uh, well, you know, human resources, uh, seafarers, uh, the way to do it is training, uh, education, and um, when you need uh, to, to get people to transition from one fuel to another, even to AI, um, they need to be trained, they need to learn how to handle those fuels. Uh, we, uh, in, in, in the LPG business, we, we, we have to train our people, our seafarers, uh, and we really um, have a, a good retention record. 
Uh, we do have cadet programs that we can bring new people on board and train them in what we do and how we do it. Uh, you know, gases is a different kind of animal than uh, liquids, and uh, it needs uh, a, a certain kind of expertise to handle that. But everything nowadays needs the technology that we are going ahead. We are talking about technology. We are talking about new fuels. We all have to learn about the new technology. We all have to learn, and so much more for our seafarers, that they need to be uh, uh, aware of the risks and the benefits of not only the technology, but the fuels that, as we put them on board the ships. And uh, even more than that, uh, we, we need to protect them and uh, help them get over that uh, new... Um, uh, so what we do is we really have uh, crew conferences at least four times a year. We bring everybody on board. We talk about all the new developments in the business. Everything that we do, whether it is a technological improvement and performance improvements, operational improvements, all these are so important in our seafarers. And I think as a shipping industry, we always take pride on our uh, seafarers and we do want to train them carefully, fully, and when we put them on board, they can operate our vessels in, 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 in safety. Thank you, John. So, the clock's ticking down. My last question. Um, later on, I think this morning, before lunch, Knut's going to have uh, two of our biggest regulators up here on the panel. We have seen in the past, and Konstantinos and I have lived through this, when you have different regulations from different geographies, things don't tend to move very quickly. Things tend, you know, we tend to get a diversion of resources and a diversion of effort. And uh, I think one thing this industry cannot afford is fragmentation of effort. We need a, that holistic effort. What would your pleas be to those regulators? Um, anybody can jump in here with, a, with, a, with an answer. But yeah, uh, first of all, I'd say, uh, John, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and some other comments were made. I'm pretty sure this can't happen without our seafarers. I'm 100% certain this energy transition cannot happen safely without our seafarers. And I think the human factor cannot be underestimated here. We must bring them along with training and the right tools. With the tools, I also want to mention energy efficiency, and sorry, there just wasn't a lot of time. It's going to be more important in the future than it is today because these fuels are all going to be more expensive and they've all got density challenges. Energy efficiency helps with both of those. And so uh, and technology tools help with that. Um, there was you know, one system mentioned here, we use OceanScore, for example, but there are other platforms out there too. Use those, but use those in a way that are truly useful to the seafarers to make them effective, more time efficient in their jobs, and safer. Thank you. To jump in, um, we take pride in Orca AI that we actually work alongside the organizations, the seafarers on board the ships to train them, measure uh, tangible KPIs, provide them the adequate tools using data, using, by the way, not fragmented data, but looking on the industry as a whole, because we work with all segments of shipping and taking insights from one segment to the other, sharing data between ships, sharing anonymous benchmarks and trends. This is the way, as we see it, to create new kind of standards uh, for seafarers built by the seafarers themselves. Uh, and putting goals on their uh, 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 voyages and assist them learn and improve over time and just continue tracking, continue tracking the same KPIs throughout the industry. Um, this is the way as we see it and of course provide them the proper incentives along the way. Um, and as we see it, this is the future. This is the future of the seafarer itself and it's happening now. The younger generations, uh, people my age, grew up with this technology. We, are, we love it, we believe in it, and we use it in our everyday lives. Uh, so we bring it on board the ships. Thank you. Two comments, uh, and that will be my last comments. I'll probably be, try to be very quick. One, on the alternative fuels universe, you know, we need to understand the complexity 
definitely our people will be very important in doing it. Right now, I'll give you an example, methanol, when it burns, it's not visible. So you get to see it with an infrared camera. So, and I'm not even gonna say about toxicity issues with you know, uh, uh, other fuels. Uh, I just wanna ask that we're not simple-minded about it. Um, you know, we have to address the challenges, you know, and there are challenges to be reckoned with. And my comment to the regulator that is coming uh, in the next panel, or the panel after, is that EU ETS and fuel EU maritime are a reality now for ships traveling in, from, and within EU. So we can only call upon EU uh, to quickly align the regulatory instruments with the IMO when they're decided. Thank you, Nick. So going back to the regulator's uh, perspective, what we're expecting, first of all, is a synchronized regulation. We don't want to see fragmented regulation, different uh, states, different uh, regulatory bodies have different regulation. That creates a lot of confusion to the technology developers, but to the, user, to the users uh, also. Um, what we're expecting, strict regulation, yep, no doubt about it, fair regulation, but also a regulation that is practical, applicable, and to serve the purpose. We don't want to see regulation just for the re regulation. We want to see regulation to serve the purpose, saving the environment, saving the, the climate, and um, safeguarding the life uh, of our children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, time's up, the clock's flashing red. Um, so just, just perhaps to, to summarize, um, as we target net zero, I think what we've heard clearly from the panel is it's not just about new molecules. There's so much we can do today with today's ships. It's not just about new buildings. There's so much we can do with technology, with uh, uh, AI, with digitalization to make today's fleet uh, more efficient. And I think as we, as we think about the future fuel mix, the one thing that is certain is that whatever we can do today with those operating practices, with training, with investment in seafarers and talent and capability, both ashore and on, and on board, every gram of fuel that we can save today will be a benefit for us well beyond 2050. So let's make sure that that's not missed as we plan our strategies going forward. Perhaps you can just join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you.